This is the Analyzing Anfield podcast on the Blood Red channel, bringing you the best tactical and statistical analysis of Liverpool FC. Hello everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Analyzing Anfield, your tactics and analytics podcast, courtesy of the Blood Red channel. I'm Josh Williams and I'm joined by the super David Hughes, who I believe is a little bit under the weather. How are you getting on, Dave? Yeah, I'm all right, mate. It's uh, it's definitely not Corona, so I don't want any allegations. Um, yeah, I'm just yeah feeling a bit, little bit off last day or two, but uh, don't want to miss the show by any means. So here we are, ready to talk about uh, about Liverpool. Yeah, I mean, although you might not be 100, percent you probably sound better than you did last week, and I hopefully do as well because we've we've reached the point of lockdown. Well, it's not lockdown anymore, but We've reached the point of working from home whereby we have upgraded the audio. So we're both speaking from high-tech pieces of kit today um, and we'll be moving forward. So hopefully we sound a bit clearer. Hopefully we sound like we are coming out the office as opposed to coming from our bedrooms. Um, but yeah, we're going to get into the football anyway. So analyzing Anfield. So we're going to talk about Leeds United. Um, the match just gone. And we're going to look ahead to Chelsea. Um, not a lot else going on, so uh, specifically in, in terms of transfers and things like that. So, if it's a shorter episode, it's a shorter episode, but we're, we're going to get into it anyway. So, yeah, Leeds United. Um, did you go, Dave? Yeah, yeah, that was there. Yeah, yeah. What did you? Uh, what did you think then? General thoughts on the game? Um, a bit mad, you know. We we I feel like we did kind of in this show last week. Um allude to the fact that this won't just be kind of your traditional champions versus a newly promoted side. You know, did we predict it would be 3-2 at half time or something similar? No, definitely not. Um, but we did anticipate something might be a little bit strange. And yeah, it was just a, an absolute wild game. Really enjoyable, I must say. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed the full 90 minutes. I don't know if all Liverpool fans did. <laughs> um, but yeah, really, really interesting game. Yeah, I mean, I, I like to think, I mean, tell us if, if if we're wrong, but I like to think that we previewed it quite well in terms of, um, you know, two really intense teams, two attacking sides. Um, obviously, we, we didn't expect seven goals, but I think we I think we actually predicted 2-1 maybe, Dave. I think we both predicted the same score. Yeah, we uh, we definitely had both teams to score, didn't we? Definitely. Uh, and maybe, a, what you know, a goal in it. Uh, in terms yeah. of a victory, and that's that's what turned out to be just a couple more goals than we expected. <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was gonna it was always gonna be an intense game, you know. Jurgen Klopp against Marcelo Bielsa, um, played out roughly as I expected in terms of the actual play and the performance and all that sort of stuff. But I must admit that I, I I didn't expect it. You know, if you'd have said to me last week with five minutes left, Liverpool will be drawing three three. You know, I, I wouldn't have predicted that. I didn't think Liverpool would um, leave it as you know, you know, leave it, leave it so close to the finish line before actually managing to get over the line with the three points. Hmm. Um, but in terms of the match, um, twenty-two shots for Liverpool against six for Leeds United. Um, four shots on target for Liverpool against three for Leeds United, and the expected goals three point three. For Liverpool, that's including penalties, and 0.6 for Leeds. Um, now, if you look at those numbers, it's it's quite probably quite surprising that ended four three, isn't it? Mm. Um, and obviously, Liverpool taking twenty two shots and only hitting the target for them. You know, not really very good at all. But you know, I, I don't know about you, but I, I found myself and I have found myself in the in the in the days since. Really frustrated by the the expectation on Liverpool's side and the the criticism of 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 the defence. Um, I tweeted about it at the time. It, it, anyone who f- follows me on Twitter and is active on Twitter will, will probably know all of my thoughts already because I've talked quite a bit about it. It's it's, it's wound me up a little bit. Um, have you agreed, Dave, or have you you know understood you know the perceptions and so um, I 
would probably say I'm somewhere in between those people and, and yourself. So I read your piece on the on the Echo, which I'm surprised you didn't plug. You know, it's a good read. Thinking it definitely gives an alternative view on the matter. Um, you know, is that a segue for you to plug it now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, if you, if you want to go and read it, it is on the Echo, and it's on it's on my Twitter at Distance Covered. It was just yeah. a piece on 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 my my perspective on things. I, th I think it's it's really easy in in situations like 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 the match against Leeds to just um, say oh yeah three points but the, the defense has to improve. Yeah, I think you've, it's very easy to to overlook the fact that Liverpool have just scored four goals um, and usually do score four goals in in games of this nature. Mm. And in games of this nature, there is usually underlying reasons as to why you can't be as controlled as usual on the defensive side. So. Yeah, if you want to go and read that, it's only a whole. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, so, carry on, Dave. Yeah, so where I, where I stand is, I do think there were some mistakes in there, but then I also believe that a lot of, you know, it's I'm really conscious of how I articulate this point because I just don't want to sound like, um, what's the term I'm looking for? I don't, want like, I don't want to sound like I'm rubbing it, in, rubbing it in and I'm at the game where so many people are stuck at home. You know, people who deserve to be there more than me, anyway. Um, but what I do find, if I start on the positive, is I don't think the cameras capture um, how difficult Liverpool's defensive line is to bypass. Um, there's so many times I was watching the leads try and attack, and so many false runs where they they were they were trying to beat the beat the offside trap, beat the line. Um, but the, it's just near on impossible. You, you, you're given the slimmest of windows in, the, in a split second to play the ball where the, the attack is going to stay on side and run onto it. And honestly, there must have been 10 or 12 times where someone like Bamford is, is waiting on the shoulder, commences his run, and the ball doesn't go, or when it does go, he's miles offside. And it's, it, it's so effective in nullifying it an attack, especially in a side like Leeds, who can go from back to front quite quick when they want to. Um, so on, on one hand, I think that's a really good example of how, how you know, it's not always justified to keep kind of picking on the, the defence and things like the high line, which seems to kind of spark plenty of debate. Um, but in terms of a negative, I guess there was two things for me that stood out in the game. One is... The obvious one, Van Dyke's, yeah, Van Dyke's error. Um, I just think what we're seeing a little bit, Josh, and I, I feel like we've spoke about this before. But what we what we liked about Van Dyke so far was it always felt like he was willing to do the uh, the old school stuff if he had to. And what I'm talking about, he's willing to just oof it into the stand to clear the way den danger. It doesn't always need to be anything too too fancy, you know, or too. Um, chauvinistic okay i don't know maybe that's not the right term but he, he he always had that element of i'm just happy to you know just be a, a defender and clear the danger first and foremost and i do feel like maybe it's because he he's so good uh, and he's been so well celebrated everywhere really he's considered probably the best defender in the world now i do wonder if maybe he's just being a little bit too casual um and that, that might sound like a lazy comment by me but if you look at Obviously, the one against Arsenal, which was under different circumstances at the back end of last season, and this one, you now he could have easily cleared his lines there. And it, it, it's like he's trying to think about. I've already dealt with this danger. I'm thinking about maybe recommencing a counter attack for ourselves. Um, and in reality, probably could have just cleared the ball away from danger and just done the basics that he was doing so well in the first kind of eighteen months. Now he's still he's still unbelievable. So how much can you really criticize him? I don't I don't think you can that much, but something I did notice. And then one other point that I just want to make really quickly, Josh, is uh I thought for the third goal there was there was an error too. Um I think I understand you make a really good point about how many players attacked for leads and it's it's quite rare uh, to see that and to deal with that. But I think if I wonder if I can maybe share something now two seconds i don't know if we can share can we? yeah i'm just yeah. going to bring something up now just to show exactly what i mean and it's um it's the basically it's, apologies if uh if you are listening rather than watching um 
obviously it's not ideal but if you are this can be viewed on youtube for those that want to go and see it. yeah exactly so if you just have a look here um as the as the dangers begin to build i can't remember who's the lead attacker who's who eventually scores i can't remember his name um, uh, yeah yeah it is he signal in, just in front of jones and behind well alden where he wants the ball to go now I think Jones is still a really inexperienced player. He's still young, so although he he should probably track that run, I'd be looking at to the to at the left of our pitcher there. I'd be looking at Robertson and Gomez. Oh, sorry, Trent and Gomez um, to be shouting there for someone to track him because they can see this danger unfolding. Um, and obviously, what happens is neither do, um, and we get into this position where he's basically able to run in, take a touch, and then fire it into the goal. As I said, I think, yeah, you could maybe get on, on Jones's back or one of the midfielders for not tracking in. But I, I think ideally, really, you want to see better communication from the defence because they've got the full picture in front of them um, of, what's, yeah. of, of what's happening and that doesn't happen. So I think if we're talking about two errors, maybe I'd, I'd be flagging them. But I agree, it's not as desperate as, as maybe you've, as sorry, as other people have tried to make out for us and you to kind of counter that. Yeah, I think I think a lot of my point was and is to do with what what do you expect almost, um, and I think with Liverpool being such a complete team now, the the expectation is always you know a controlled defensive performance because that's what we've got used to for the past two years. That's what Liverpool do when they're on form. But I think when you play teams like Leeds, Leeds are mental. And when you play teams like Leeds and you play teams like Salzburg. And Chelsea at the back end of last season, they are crazy on the attacking side. Um, you know, you, you know, every now and then Liverpool will face a team like that, and they, they will come to Anfield and they will think, you know what, we're gonna go for it basically, and they, and they won't really adjust, they won't really show Liverpool much respect, and they'll attack as though they're attacking Burnley or Newcastle or Brighton or you know whoever you want, um, and. I think Liverpool, when that happens, keep attacking, at, you know, in the same way almost. And it's it's kind of like, it's it's proper attacking football is what it is really. It's it's two teams, both showcasing attacking football. Um, you know, there's, there's virtually no midfield. Complete disregard for what for the concept of what a midfield is. Um, and the ball just seems permanently in transition. I referenced basketball in, in the piece because it kind of is you have a go, we have a go, end to end. And th that's just kind of what happens when you face a team that are, that are so attacking. When you face a team that are as attacking as Liverpool. And, um, you know, again, apologies for those who are listening. But you mentioned earlier, Dave, about, about false runs. I think this is probably... The perfect viz for that. Um, can you see that? Yeah, mate, we got that up now. Well, that's that, that's pretty much what you what you was describing, wasn't it? I mean, that, that, that's yeah. what you're dealing with. I mean, from a perspective of Liverpool's back line there, that is scary. You know, if you, every every Liverpool defender there, if you look at Trent, if you look at Gomez, Van Dijk, and Robertson, every single sense, every single defender has got a player who's left and a player who's right. Um, you're looking over your shoulder as well, you, as well as trying to look forward where the actual ball is. It's difficult to deal with, isn't it? Hmm. No. Um. What's interesting with that though, and it, it, it kind of reaffirms the point I was making earlier, is there's only really, actually, no. You wouldn't even say uh, there's not one player that could be, um, uh, could receive the ball in in that in that moment because of the the way Liverpool's defence is set up, like they're all offside. So yeah. theoretically, you've got four attackers there who are unable to uh, get get involved in the uh, in the passage of play really unless they have to drop back in um and i think just whilst you're making a separate point i think it's just good to point that out now that that's how difficult really it can be to bypass liverpool's defense you know in these in these moments yeah um but i, I just felt i just felt like it was a bit it was a bit harsh almost to to, to look at the performance and another kind of um, you have a go, we have a go type match that Liverpool have had a few of. They don't have that many anymore because so many teams are almost afraid 
to do to do it with Liverpool. But when you when teams do, it's it, it's incredibly hard to to be in control of your own defence when you've got so many players running at you in all different directions, so many rotations, all that sort of stuff. Um, another little photo here. I think this is probably one one of the best to catch your me points. You know, look at look, look at that. I, 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 that is that is difficult to defend against. Mm. Um, you've got four players there in the box, two players on the verge of entering it. In fact, no, three players on the verge of entering it. That photo you showed before of uh, Matthias Kleek's finish, at that point, there was, there was five players in the box at that time. So it, it's it's just difficult. And if you, if you look at Liverpool's midfield and where Liverpool's midfield, uh, where Liverpool's front three maybe is and all that sort of stuff, Maybe getting more players back is the answer. Maybe encouraging more players to stay behind the ball is the answer. But then you you lose a bit on the attacking side. You will you will lose a bit when you get the ball and are able to counter attack and all that sort of stuff. And I think that was that that was one of the concluding points in my piece. Just you know along the lines of like it it was just proper attacking football. Mm. You know Klopp and a fella on the opposite side who's of the same mould really. Um, in terms of just the belief in in getting players forward, attacking as a unit, defending as a unit, and um, I just I just felt like it was it it's, it was really easy, really simplistic to uh, after the match say oh Liverpool won, scored four goals, but they conceded three. The defense has to improve. I just you know there's a reason we conceded three against Salzburg. There's a reason we conceded three against Chelsea. We had a, a, a bit of an issue last season against Norwich. On the defensive side, we only conceded one, but they were perceived to have caused us problems. Mm. But it's because the, these are teams that have came to Anfield brave and have tried to go toe to toe with Liverpool. Um, fair play for doing it, you know, because at the end of the day, there's, there's, there's almost two approaches really. There's, there's the, the lie down approach of, you know, <clears throat> we will try and leave here with a point by hanging on for 90 minutes. Mm. And there's, there's the there's the proactive approach of of going at Liverpool and trying to take take your face into your own hands sort of thing, and not many teams do it because of because they're aware that Liverpool and Klopp's biggest strength throughout the course of his career has been in transition. Mm. But every now and then a team has a goal, and Leeds were one of them. Liverpool won the game, and you usually win these games. And you know, someone said to me, um. Obviously, Liverpool managed to win the match with a, a late penalty. Would you be writing this piece if um, if Liverpool drew the match? So it's a good point. You know, it's a, it's a fair comment. But I said to him, you know, if we're talking about what ifs, Liverpool took twenty-two shots, Leeds took six, Leeds took three shots on target, every single one found on net. So in terms of what ifs, it it for me it was another example of a head-to-head, toe-to-toe type match that Liverpool have got the better end of, basically. Um, mm. And I, 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 can't, I can't really envisage many teams in, in Europe who could go toe-to-toe with Liverpool like that and, and get the better side of things. Yeah. I mean, on that as well, OK, yeah. They, 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 look, there is some fortune if you get a penalty last few minutes of the game to, to, you know, to get the winning goal. But if you're also thinking the build-up to that, uh, I think the corner, the pool construct a good, a really good piece of play. Um, I think it's Salah it drives forward into Mane and then into Firmino, and Firmino really fluffs his lines like that. That felt like a big chance. I don't know what the XG was on that, but it felt like for a player of his quality, although he's not maybe firing on all cylinders at the moment, you'd expect a Liverpool forward to convert that. Um, so again, on that point, if you're talking about what ifs, you know, what if he scores that? It's it's four three via that goal, um, so yeah, it's I don't think you can, you can really dwell too much on you know how the game was won at the end of the day. At the end of the day, it was it was one four three, and yeah, I do agree. I think that's that's kind of what's good about this Liverpool side. I think you know they've introduced over the last two years a, a more controlling and uh, dominating style. Um, you know, Klopp's adapted really from being that transitional manager to this kind of a manager who's got a side who really controls games. Um, but if if teams do want to kind of 
go back to the old school and take them on. Um, they might have success in terms of scoring goals, but that's only half the job. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna be scoring three at the other end, you need to make sure you're not scoring for you're not conceding four or five in 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 return. And that's the problem. Each side who's done that so far has got. You know, the the yet yeah, they can find a way to get through Liverpool and score more than once. Um, but it's it's all a waste of time if you can't you know keep it keep it solid at the other end and. Um, you can see why on that basis many teams don't tend to adopt that approach. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you think of those teams that I've just mentioned, uh, you know, I, I did tweet about it at the time. Uh, Leeds, Chelsea, Salzburg, Norwich. These are teams that you could say have made Liverpool's defence look a little bit like, you know, six and seven sort of thing, a little bit disorganised and all that sort of stuff. But also, you also have to then think about well, on the day, what what was their defence like at the time? Because it, usually it's 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 worse than Liverpool's, um, and it's 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 kind of the spoke a few times on the show about the whole concept of double je jeopardy sort of thing. It's kind of you damned if you do, damned if you don't against Liverpool. As in, you have to come if players forward to attack sort of thing, but then you're probably going to get done going the opposite way. Whereas if you just kind of lay down and hold on for 90 minutes, you're probably going to concede one goal at least and then you're behind and you have to chase the game sort of thing. So Liverpool are really good with that, that strategic element. Um, Guardiola spoke about it a few times and I think Solskjaer has mentioned it. Um, but just another little note on that Van Dijk thing, the, um, the little letter. I think ultimately he'll, he'll benefit from that. Maybe he needed it. Um, and um, it just made me think of when we first signed Allison. He obviously arrived for a world record fee at the time for a goalkeeper, and he was doing um Cruyff turns, and you know he was um he he was lobbing opposing players with his with his first touch and all this sort of stuff. Kind of, I felt to justify his level, his ability, sort of thing. And he got done away at Leicester, got the ball snatched off him, conceded the goal. Made a little bit of a show of himself, and all them mad Cruyff turns and all that that he was doing on his debut and all sorts, of, all that sorts of stuff. Dev stopped now, um, so I feel like it was kind of you know you play with fire, you get burned. Allison got burned, learned his lesson. Maybe Van Dijk will benefit from getting burned on the first day of the season. No points cost, but nearly did. Maybe he'll just you know okay you know snap out of it sort of thing. Yeah, just go back to the kind of basics that made him so successful. Not that I'm saying he's a basic defender by any means, but as I said, I always felt he had the kind of characteristics of a top defender in other areas, but then he'd also have this no-nonsense approach that was was actually appealing. You know, it, it just... Because it, it just feels reliable then, you know, he's not going to do anything daft. Like, if I, say, if you think of someone like um, John Stones, for example, I think Stones... You know, is a great ball player, can be a good defender, but he always feels like he has a, a mistake in him. And obviously, Van Dyke's nowhere near it is level in that regard, but it's 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 really an off-putting quality. Um, and as uh, you you do kind of want Van Dyke if he's if he's going to kind of stay as the as the best to maybe just adopt that no nonsense approach again. And I agree, maybe you can just get complacent. It's just human nature, and, and hopefully for. For, for his sake and from a Liverpool point of view, it will kind of go back to back to basics and back to just doing what he does well. Yeah, I think what, what Van Dijk's good with, what he's been good with since coming to Liverpool, is, it's the whole concept of like percentage football sort of thing. Um, taking the risk when it's worth the risk, avoiding the risk when there's potential danger there sort of thing, putting the ball on the stands when it's not worth it and all that sort of stuff. Liverpool will go with that sort of thing. Speaking of risk, um, I think that's that's basically what the match was. It was proper high risk football, um, end to end, no midfield, and just again want to hone in on the point that I think it's when the match is like that, and you're playing an opponent like that, it is really really hard to defend against and and to defend with control and luck. As I mean, p p people expect some people expect like Liverpool to to showcase the same level of control. That they maybe will against Newcastle, who will counter attack with three players, 
that uh, t- to expect you know the same level of control against Leeds who are counter attack with seven players. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a different game, and it's it's difficult to, to remain so defensively assured. And I should reaffirm as well: Liverpool faced only six shots on the day, only three on uh, three on target. Um, maybe this is a good segue to have a little word about Allison. Obviously, it's the first first game of the season, but three shots on target, three goals from an expected goals of 0.6. Mm. It's not the best for Allison, is it? No, not really. Um, especially the first one. Yeah, the first uh, one, yeah. Yeah, the, the other two you can kind of make exceptions for, but the first one, near, pretty much near post, wasn't it? Just, I'm not saying they're they easy save to make because the, they're not at the end of the day. You know, it's 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 absolute elite level football. These shots are fast. It's all happening within, you know, split seconds. But... It's just we know Alisson's capable of pulling off the saves in those situations, you know, because he's how good he is. And, um, yeah, he does look... He, it's hard, isn't it? You don't want to make kind of really premature uh, assumptions, especially just on one game. But it's just not what we're accustomed to. And um, you probably would be expecting a little bit better from him if we're being, if we're being honest. You know, that to be conceding that many goals. I mean, how, how many did Liverpool concede all of last season? Um, well, I think I think the back end of the season. Was oh yeah, skewed it. Great. So the first uh, season was about twenty one, was it? Twenty two, I think. Yeah, something 22. like that. So if you think what well, that's like, he's probably roughly like a seventh and eighth. He's conceded in one game, or he conceded in that whole campaign, pretty much. Um, which just seems bizarre, but um, yeah, probably could have done better for me. Yeah, I'm just looking at his numbers. Yeah, I mean. Obviously, it's one game. We should not be doing this. No, um, I'm not going to be happy. No, looking at his underperformance, overperformance sort of thing. But he's actually, according to post shots XG, he's, he's only underperformed by 0.9 in that game. I thought it would have been more than that, considering he's conceded three goals for next year of 0.6. But obviously, that captures that the sh- maybe the shots were better than we, better than we're giving them credit for. But well, they were they were well executed, obviously. You know they were good, yeah, yeah. good finishes. The bounce was not hard, but I will say as well. I, I, that's just made me think: was the first one outside the box? Mm, was it, Josh? This is a big moment if it is, you know, because um, mm, the only awesome. goal Allison has conceded from outside the box in the Premier League for Liverpool was direct from a corner against Burnley. And it was a foul at the time as well for me, but you know, it didn't get given. But this would be the first from open play in the Premier League, I think, that Allison's conceded from outside the area. This was Jack Harrison. Certainly on the very edge. He's running in. Uh, oh, no, it's just in. Oh, just in, the, in the box. He lives to fight another day, another <laughs> game week. Yeah, no, just inside it was. I will say on that as well. Just, I mean, it's related to what we're going to talk about next in terms of Chelsea, but I saw a stat during the Chelsea match yesterday that I think Kepa since Kepa's debut which is obviously the same as Alisson's debut same same summer has conceded 19 from outside the box <laughs> in the same period wow that's which is quite insane Alisson obviously conceded one direct from a corner so a bit of a difference there hmm. um so I think one more note that I'd like to that I'd like to point out I can't I can't overlook him is Mo Salah I thought he was absolutely on fire. I thought he was possibly the sharpest I've seen him in in a long time, really. Um, he just looked on it, didn't he? He just looked um, mm-hmm. raring to go, sort of thing. Yeah, he was uh, he was ludicrous. I, I've, actually, I've actually got some numbers from that game that I've I come across this morning. Uh, he took nine shots against Leeds, the most he's ever attempted in a Premier League match. He took nine shots? Yeah. Which is I just double check that. <laughs> yeah, that, that that I imagine that's come from maybe a different provider to what we use, but yeah, it's going to be nine there or thereabouts uh, against Leeds, which is the most he's ever attempted in a Premier League match. Uh, yeah, nine so, according to understat as well. Wow, he's uh, he had twenty one touches in the opposition box as well, which is uh, twice the amount of any other player in the league. Um, he, he was, just, but I, I don't even think it was just in the attacking third. I feel like he was just. A machine everywhere really he was so on it um you know even that that goal he scored was just wow you know from nothing really and the, the finish was phenomenal 
Um, and was it was it right footed? Uh, I'm not sure. You know, if, if it was, I didn't pick up on that at the time. Maybe I uh, maybe I'm I'm going overboard on giving him credit there, but I'll I'll have a look while you're chatting. But yeah, I thought he was uh, I thought he was brilliant. I did honestly. Uh, he looked he looked to have a new level in that game. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure you've just mentioned about us. Did you, did you mention a shot assist there? I didn't, no. He actually posted four shot assists as well. So that know, is, that's, you know, that's, that's nine shots, four shots. It was left footed, sorry, mate. Yeah. Say that again. It was left footed, good left-footed, touch with the right, and then with the left. Go on, carry on, sorry. Yeah, well, you know, even if it was left footed, I couldn't do that with my feet. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a go, like. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just thought he was a. Uh, absolutely spot on and we seem to have very occasional notes on this show regarding fantasy football don't we and mm. he, my plan was to get rid of him this week but he goes and scores three he plays that well i just i don't think i can touch him he's it, it's as sharp as i've seen him for a long time money and but you know by contrast seemed very quiet yeah um but yeah maybe it's hopefully it's a an indication of form for Salah as opposed to just a really good day because he, he I'd, I'd love to see him kind of go on a run like that where he's just so sharp and where people maybe overlook the fact that he gives the ball away every now and then because when he doesn't when he gives the ball away a little bit less and he's that bit more you know that bit better with his execution shooting and passing he gets the credit he deserves in, in games like that yeah, but I mean, this is a really good. Okay, this is a little bit more extreme than usual, but this is just a really good um, kind of illustration of Salah the player, isn't it? He scored three goals, but he took nine shots to get it. But that's not a negative. You know, he's just a, a, again using that same term, but he's just all about output, just tons of output. But you get you get the um, reward for it, basically. You know, you get you get the goals, you get the shot assists. You know, is is that it, it, the, almost the, the the talent is getting into those positions and getting those shots off at, at, at such a high you know um, high quantity? Um, that's that's in many ways one of his, his, his best talents. Yeah, just one other little side note on the match as well, which I thought was was a bit mad. Um, obviously, I spoke about high risk football um, and that sort of stuff. If you look at the possession numbers of both teams, um, the the passing accuracy of both teams was terrible. <laughs> um, Liverpool's passing passing accuracy on the day was seventy five percent, Leeds seventy five percent. So you got you got two teams there that are giving the ball away twenty five percent at the time, which is you know a quarter at the time. So I think that offers a, a pretty clear insight into the, the amount of turnovers during a game and yeah you just know, the basketball match just yeah to further reiterate that point i did notice that um liverpool's average number of passes per possession dropped from an average of 5.77 across the past 12 months to 3.47 and that kind of links to the point you're making that it was just most likely um less passes more passes just going from defense to attack um and probably more attack minded passes which is obviously tend to be a little bit more difficult in terms of accuracy in terms of getting where they need where where the intended target is compared to you know we just moving it from side to side so yeah a bit of a bit of a wild a wild game and you know Liverpool played the part yeah i mean we'll, we'll round up there on the leads match um but yeah i just wanted to kind of push home the the, the fact that for me at least it's Liverpool's defensive performance isn't as, you know, organised and disciplined as usual. Sometimes there's underlying reasons behind that, and especially when you're playing the team that are getting seven players into the final third, five players into the box, it, it and Liverpool are scoring four at the opposite end. It's difficult to retain control in a match like that, and sometimes you have to be a little bit more understanding, I think, about, about what, what's actually happened, why Liverpool have looked a little bit all over the place at times despite facing only six shots so next mind you i was going to say next match it's going to improve but we've got chelsea and <coughs> you know a few months back when he came to Anfield, it, it finished five three so <laughs> chelsea aren't too different to be honest to leeds in terms of the the relentless daft at times attacking 
Um, but yeah, we'll get into Chelsea anyway. So, did you see the game yet last night, Dave? Um, we're recording on a Tuesday, so Chelsea played last night against Brighton, one three one. Hmm. Uh, thoughts? I was really disappointed, actually. Um, just in term in Chelsea in general, I just thought they didn't look that great at all. You know, if I kind of think of. I'm not saying I was expecting them to be unbelievable. I know it takes time for players to adapt, but I'm trying to think of an equivalent. I, I thought Arsenal looked fairly good against Fulham, for example, and their team who I'm kind of expecting to be a lot different this year. And I just thought Chelsea looked well off it. Um, you know, I, I thought the general play, you know, they just looked looked really disjointed. Again, I appreciate there was new new bodies in there. I thought Havert struggled a little bit in the game. Um, but yeah, a little bit disappointed, to be honest. Yeah, they looked um, a little bit a little bit languid, I thought. Um, almost as though it was the end of last season, as opposed mm. to a new campaign. Um, it looked like the legs had gone and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, Lampard's offered a bit of an insight into, into why that's the case. Obviously, he's, I think he's had only a few days with certain players... Um, a lot of players have been on international duty, but they have Liverpool as well, so I'm not too sure about, about that one. Um, I must say, Timo Werner looked quite sharp, which we will probably get to. But yeah, as a team, they did. They, they looked probably the opposite of fluid. Um, lack of understanding, lack of cohesion, lack of mobility. But I think, yeah, I think Lampard probably summed it up quite well in terms of just leaning towards the the intangibles so you know he, he lent on the fact that it was quite a resilient performance just one of them that kind of like you know at your best but you managed to get away with an away win 3-1 mm. all that sort of stuff i think they were lucky with the penalty because up until that point they, they'd been virtually nothing in the game well um, just just quickly on that point before you carry on i did know just like i was just about to tweet last night if you knew nothing about these teams and you were told one was like a top four side and one was, you know, bottom half. I think you would have expected it to be Brighton who were the who were the better side. You know, after an hour, although Chelsea led two one, so it was just it, you know, it was uh, Brighton had, had eleven shots, um, Chelsea only had four. Brighton had just under sixty three percent of the possession. Chelsea had, had like, you know, thirty seven. Um, you know, they were Brighton, but actually, that's what I will say. Although it's a little bit off topic, I thought Brighton would look pretty good, actually. Yeah, the thing with Brighton, the toothless when it comes to the actual mm -hmm. business end of the pitch, in terms of putting the ball in the net, they're not clinical enough. Um, obviously, Liverpool are. Salah, if he stays in this mood, you know, I'm looking forward to him getting potential chances. Obviously, they've got Kepper in goal still. Um, but you mentioned about Chelsea there, particularly Chelsea's start. I'm just checking now, but I remember watching the game at the time and it felt like about an hour passed and Havertz hadn't touched the ball. Um, I'm pretty sure... What, so Havertz's first touch was was eight minutes in. Um, so he went, he, went, he went eight minutes without touching the ball and even even that touch was just w w one one flick on Zavena. Um, <clears throat> I didn't like how Lampard used him. To be honest, I think he's. I think you're missing the trick if you if you don't use Havertz in a central position because he's so like ambidextrous almost, really two footed. Spatial awareness is brilliant. I think if you if you play him on a wing, yeah, um, yeah, you're missing the trick. You're not getting the best out of him for me. Yeah, and he played. I think he played Werner through the middle, four two three one, lost his cheek through the middle. Um, yeah. And he looked and well. on the right. Didn't he looked off at Loftus cheek? Yeah, well, there was one point where he was he, he was breaking with Werner, just had to play him yeah. in. That, that was it, and he he played the pass like it was like he was playing in the park or something. I think he tries to meg, um, he tries to meg dunk, but I'm like, just get the ball around him. You know, where you've trained with Werner and out for a while. You know how quick he is. Just put it either side of him and let him run onto it. But he tries to meg him, and it just doesn't come off. Um, it's quite frustrating because. You know, I would have liked, you know, this game on the weekend aside, I just would have liked to see him win, you know, open his account and kind of see how far he can go this year. Um, but he was let down a little bit by players around. But he did look sharp, definitely look sharp. 
Yeah, well, I was just going to say, what did you think of Werner? Because I've, I've just checked his numbers. He actually had five shots hmm. and assisted the shots as well. So he's played a key role in, in six of Chelsea's shots there. Hmm. And they had, they had a total of um, nine. So he, he, he's probably been the best player on the day for them, but as opposed to, well, maybe with James alongside him. But other than them two, I, I, I don't think they had... They had much on the day, Chelsea, so I think they've got quite a bit to do in, in the week up until facing facing the champions. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's 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 definitely, you know, fair. I think Lampard secretly had, had he actually alluded to it in the, before the match. I think he would have really liked to have seen Havertz look on it alongside Wayne and just to play, just look that you know, sorry, just the team, just look a lot more fluid and he's probably now thinking, well they they weren't really so you know, does that change uh, how he kind of approaches the game against Liverpool? I'm not sure. Um, just, just out of interest, Dave, when he's got a fully fit squad, how are you using that team? I mean, I put you on the spot a little bit there, but how how would you how would you deploy them? I don't know. It's but it it depends really. I've I just I think he might have to try. It's really difficult to keep players happy. But I don't know if maybe he's just going to have to accept that he can't have all the players playing at the same time. So Because he could maybe go for like a 4-3-3, I guess. Because you want to include, obviously, Werner in there. I think people forget about Pulisic. He's, he, he looked fantastic when he started playing regularly last season. Um, Havertz, is, Havertz is actually the toughest one for me to place, you know. I don't know. I feel like he... The formation needs to be built a little bit more around him than anyone else. So I'm not sure how he's going to do that. Whether he's going to use him as like a ten in a four two three one, I don't know. Is the answer, Josh? I think, I think of all the teams in the Premier League, they're the ones I look at and think I'm not sure how they're going to they're going to line up. Yeah, as I said, I think I think you're right in terms of have it kind of being a bit of a Firmino really in terms of um, you do have to. Work around him a little bit. He's not the type of player you can just stick on the wing or, mm. or something like that. Although he's incredibly versatile, mm. he's clearly very good at set things. And it, like it, I, I like the thoughts of Havertz playing like Firmino, Werner playing as Mane, and you know maybe Pulisic on on, on the opposite side. But then obviously Pulisic I think is right footed. Yeah, you could look at it. Maybe a four four two with Werner and Havertz through the middle, and Ziyech and Pulisic on the flanks. See Ziyech as well, yeah. It's, that's what I mean. He's got a lot, and yeah. uh, considering how much he's got, I'm not sure he's the best to solve that problem. Mm. I mean, it's not really a problem. It's a nice problem, isn't it? But in terms of being a bit of a tactical mind, who's going to integrate it and and you know all that sort of stuff. Mm. He he got his, his playful there, like yeah. No, it's um it's a really good point because yeah, okay, it's fantastic attackers and you got loads to choose from. But would you be especially as a as a, a young manager? Would you be better just having a set kind of two or three forwards that you know where you you start forwards and it's kind of a lot more simple because obviously he's, he's now a game into the season, three points on the board, of course. But you're like. I don't think he probably knows his best his best side, you know, his best attack, even how they're going to play this year. He probably has an idea, but he doesn't know for sure. And it seems a little bit like people always say, you know, it's a really good headache to have. I'm not always convinced by that saying. I think it can be a little bit of a unnecessary distraction. Yeah, and to be honest, considering how the season has just kind of like started at a bit of a out of nowhere really you, you're probably looking beyond christmas before he gets an actual feel for who has to play where they have to play who he can leave out and get away with but he even likes a hudson Adoy, tammy abraham you're not even thinking about them and they're no. two really talented kids who are still 20 22 and 21 maybe or something like that i think they should be moving to be honest before the window shuts um, because they're clearly not going to play. You've got Mason Mount as well. thought Mason Mount looked okay when he came on yesterday. Um, Mason, so if you include Mason Mount in there, you've got like three players who will be like bit part roles, cup games, and maybe Mount will have more of a say, actually, but certainly Abraham and 
looks in the door. I can't see them, you know, playing week in, week out. So if I was them, even if it was just a lower move, I'd try and try and get out again. Um, yeah, well, we'll Loftus Cheek played as the number ten. You got Ross Barkley coming on playing as whatever you want him to play as, and yeah, yeah, he's got to play full. And as I said, it's it's a nice thing to have. Maybe if you pick one the other, but I'm not sure. I'd have that much faith in Lampard to get the right stuff out of the right players and you know all that sort of stuff. But just to capture the performance against Brighton, um, they got outshot. So Brighton had 13, Chelsea had 9. And they expected goals, Brighton 1.3, Chelsea 1.2, but that's including the penalty. And a penalty is usually about 0.76. So without the penalty, Chelsea, you know, virtually not in there, to be honest. Not until we're able to talk from a Liverpool perspective, but it's just, it, it's how on it they'll be able to get in the space of a week on the mental side as well mm. you know all that sort of stuff if if i got a bit of a vibe to be honest in the match that the the kind of knew all the signs that they'd made the they, they were the last to play on the weekend it felt like there was a bit of a spotlight on them and it felt like they were a little bit uncomfortable with that i thought but yeah i, I don't know maybe it's going to take a bit a bit longer than than chelsea wants to actually get all things fired and them. yeah which is which is fine, you know. We we accept there might be some sort of adaptation period, but you don't want to be facing Liverpool, and it's probably a good sign from a Liverpool perspective to to be playing them uh, rather than playing them, you know, two months down the line where he's maybe settled on a form of you know starting eleven. Um, it's probably a good time for Liverpool to play them, and obviously they still have some weaknesses that will probably come on to now that can be exploited. Yeah, I mean, top of that list. Goalkeeper, mm. I mean, we can't look past him, can you? No. Do you, Do you even think he'll start after 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 yesterday? You know, you got the you got the champions. You're gonna you're gonna face at least five shots on Tiger probably. Mm. Um, do you think he's starting? Um, I think he get, might. If he gets dropped two games in, that's a that's a hell yeah. of a statement. That. I mean, the, the interesting thing is, and and I, you always have to take anything in 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 press conferences with a, a pinch of salt because it's only the manager telling you what he wants you to hear. But, you know, Lampard said after the game that I'm pretty sure he said they, they weren't looking at another goalkeeper. Um, but they also said that he was quite quite happy with Kepa's performance. He said, I, I'm not, I've not seen if, he's, if, he, if he could have done better for the goal, but I thought he was good on the night. I didn't. You know, I thought he probably could have done better for the goal. And a couple of times he flapped as well from corners. Um, I just think the damage is done. I actually think Kepa is now beyond the point of return. People, when they talk about him, reference the the Gay's first season or the the Hayes first season at United um, as the kind of something to compare it to and look how he went on. But I just think Kepa won't come back from this at Chelsea because the players just have no faith in him. He hasn't really shown anything. You no, know, he, he wouldn't even say, "Oh well, he's a great shot stop stopper," because he's not. So you're like, what is he actually good at? Um, and that's a difficult question to ask, I think. Yeah, I, mean, answer, no. I should say. Yeah, no, I do think he. Um, it, the, the comparisons with the, a young De Gea are a little bit, little bit off for me. Um, I don't think that accurate. I, I, I don't see much in him in terms of what he's going to become and like that. And I think he's he, he's. He's going to cost you points at the end of the day. He's really going to cost you points. And I think generally talking about points and goal difference and over the course of a full campaign, I think the contribution of a goalkeeper is probably a bit underrated, to be honest. I think if you... One, I was watching a Monday Night Football last night and I think one a point kind of got a Neville made quite accurately is that you, you can't really think of one as a, a single Premier League winner, really. Who have, who have managed it with a with a bad keeper? Mm. I can't. I, I think the closest that I can think of is is Mignolet with Liverpool. Obviously, we f- fell short on the Rodgers and stuff, but it doesn't. It just doesn't really happen much. And another, another point that was made was that you know, when when a season's finished and a title winner wants to go and look and strengthen a new team, it strengthen the team, strengthen the title winning team to go again. They might look at like, oh, we can improve there, we can we can upgrade that position. It's never the keeper, is it? They, they no. never look at the keeper after after winning the league and go, 
we can improve our goalkeeper here. It's mm. it's just it doesn't seem to ever happen. It's kind of like a a vital thing and from a Liverpool perspective, from a Liverpool forward perspective, you, you would be licking your lips, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. To, to the extent that maybe it even comes into the tactical talking on that, and you and you think and see yourself like from from a perspective of shot locations, may, maybe you kind of if if your usual barrier is eighteen yard box, maybe you're extending it by five yards just for, for the sake of Kepa. Open the parameters a little bit. Yeah, well, exactly. Who was in goal for the meeting at Anfield? Oof. Uh, I think it was Kepa, yeah. Because I think yeah. he missed. I think the next one was when he got dropped because he obviously conceded five. Yeah, well, you know, it's <laughs> the reason behind that. But Fabinho, was was that the game where Fabinho scored the worldie? No, it wasn't. Yeah, was it? Oh, was I think it? so. I think or so. Was, it, was that Palace? Yeah, no, they're, they're all made into one those lo- lockdown games. Um, yeah, but, I mean, Alexander Arnold scored an amazing free kick, didn't he? Um, the one I'd be thinking about on that on that point that you're talking about, Josh, is the the, the set pieces corners. You know, I play for the corners a little bit more because you've got phenomenal um, delivery into the box. You know, in, in the form of Robertson and Trent, and then um, Van Dijk is just really difficult to track in the air. You, you know, he obviously scored on the weekend with a header, and you'd fancy him to do it again. So. Would would there maybe be more of an emphasis on driving that towards the byline and winning corner balls, knowing that they could be um, ways to basically create really good scoring opportunities? Where in previous games or other games, you may be inclined to turn back, you know, maintain possession, maintain pressure. Maybe in this game, it'll be a case of no, you know, hit the ball at them, win the corner ball, and that's going to be a really good attacking opportunity for us. Yeah, no, it's a good shot. Last time we played Stamford Bridge, we, we obviously won 2-1. and I'm talking in the Premier League at least, and both both of our goals were set pieces. Trent scored a direct free kick, and then we got another free kick near the corner flag. It came in and was headed in by, I think, Firmino. So uh, it's definitely, I think we scored, I think we scored one, a, a pass of the five that we scored at Anfield in the second meeting. Um, and if we didn't, I remember sending out an analyzing Anfield newsletter on a little um, ploy used by Wijnaldum on Rhys James, where there was a block involved. That would have been on the newsletter if you've signed up. If you haven't, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, do it now. <laughs> yeah, do it now, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I think set pieces are a big thing. and I, I'm not sure. I don't think Brighton scored from one, did he? No, no, they no. didn't. As I said, they did have, and I'm, I think Dunk misses a good chance. Yeah, he did. Remember, if that did that come from a set piece? I think so. Yeah. Otherwise, why yeah. is Lewis Dunk at the back post? You know yeah, true. Yeah. So yeah. you know, yeah. you're talking fancy football, mate. Could have done with that one going in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think from the perspective of Chelsea, they're not really ideally suited to to dealing with with set pieces. I don't think Thiago Silva will play just yet. No. Keep a string goal. The the height that Lampard was talking about wanting to add, I'm not sure really sure he's added. I mean, Havertz is about 6 2, but you know, in terms of defending corners, I'm not sure he's going to offer you a great deal. No, um, not a game, really, is it? No. One other little weakness that I'd like to just put a note on is obviously Salah was playing out of his skin against Leeds, and Ben Shilwell is injured, and Marcos Alonso receives pelters basically by the Chelsea supporters as far as I'm aware at least don't think he's the best on the defensive side he's about 32 I think 33 maybe is he or am I, am I over, overdoing that well I'll check now go on continue with your point uh... obviously he's not the quickest so I can see Salah maybe getting a lot of joy there um I think Last time Salah played Chelsea, I think. 29, 30 this oh, year. 29, yeah, okay. Yeah, it was 30 so this year, so you're not far off. Yeah. I think last time Salah played Chelsea as well, I think Rudiger gave him a bit of a, a difficult time. And Rudiger didn't play against Brighton, did he? It was uh, Christensen, who was about 5'10, I think. Mm. And and Kurt Zuma, I think it was. So may, maybe Salah will get a bit more joy again this week. Yeah, I think the form he's in. Alonso, you know, most likely fairly low on confidence. You probably look at him as someone who offers more in attack than defence. 
Yeah, his work's cut out definitely against Salah, as I said, especially in this form, and that that could kind of be one of the areas where Liverpool kind of get the most joy in the game. Um, I, I I must be honest, I'm not. Uh, it, I, I imagine this game will get a lot of build up, but I'll I'd be expecting something special from Chelsea to to try and from what I from what I witnessed on Monday to to get something out of this one. Well. We might as well use that as a segue to predictions then. Um, how do you see this one maybe playing out on the tactical side and stuff like that and being won and lost? And what score do you actually think it'll end up? So, I fancy Liverpool for this one. Um, beyond everything we talked about on the Leeds game, I just thought that game, that goal was really important in terms of starting with a win. If you were to drop points in game one, you know, you would have straight away been on the back foot pretty much, wouldn't you, to an extent. Uh, obviously, it wouldn't be in panic stations by any means. So, I think there'll be a, that feel-good factor. I think Liverpool just got so much more from an attacking point of view. Still really strong from a defensive point of view. So, I fancy Liverpool to win 3-1. I think there will be a set-piece goal in there and yeah, probably back Salah to get another one as well. And nowhere else I fancy score. Full of predictions today. No, it's just a scoreline. Uh, I try not to give too many because it gives you more opportunities to be wrong. But I think you might see a bit of a reaction from from uh, for me you know, as well because um, you know he's been getting a lot of stick and I think he uh, he doesn't he hasn't become a bad player overnight. So I suspect you might see a bit of a reaction from him. Yeah, hopefully you do a few. To be honest, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, it's it's difficult one this. Because uh, it, it really does depend on what Chelsea turn up. Um, if the Chelsea that turned up last year at Stamford Bridge turn up, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I think it'll be maybe a draw. Even though we won that game 2-1, I feel like they were really competitive in that game. We benefited from set pieces, but the actual performances of both sides was quite even, I thought. Mm. Um, but if Chelsea end like they were against Brighton and... You know, if the new faces are still not really too settled, if Thiago Silva doesn't play, Chilwell is out still. Um, if Havertz plays on the wing again. <laughs> Practically Havertz. right back, I think it was. I saw the <laughs> Sam Maguire share the Viz this morning. Yeah, yeah. Like, looks like he's playing right back. <laughs> yeah, so if, if that Chelsea turns up, I think Liverpool will win. But I'm going to go I'm gonna go 2-1 Liverpool. But it does, it does feel like one of those that it's too early to see how Chelsea. It's too early to see the season Chelsea are gonna have. I think is what I'm getting at. Hmm. Um, to be honest, the first two weeks for Liverpool to play Chelsea and Leeds, Liverpool are offering an insight for the league of what those two teams are gonna have in terms of the season. Two two unknown teams. They're really in terms of how Bielsa's style of play is gonna cope in the Premier League. Hmm. How all these new players are gonna cope with Lampard and all that sort of stuff so Liverpool are really offering the first insights into that so it, from our perspective it really is complete predictions at the minute but um, hopefully we're right hopefully Liverpool win and and yet we'll be we will be back next week to, to talk about the match how it went and we will be looking ahead to another difficult game in Arsenal away from home I think in, in fact no, I think it's at Anfield I think that's yeah. a tough game isn't it Played yeah. them out. That'll be third time playing in about eight weeks. Yeah, yeah, and we haven't we haven't actually fared too well. Actually, we beat, we got beat in the charity shield, obviously on pens at least. Yeah, and we lost two one at the Emirates because of really uncharacteristic mistakes, which are unlikely to save us again. I'm think I'm I'm expecting to, considering uh, we'd won the league back then, we haven't now. So yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get to that next week anyway. So nice one for tuning in, Dave. Uh, for for joining us Dave and, uh, <laughs> and tuning in after <laughs> yeah yeah hopefully you feel better though ahead of next week hopefully mate thanks cheers everyone <laughs> cheers nice one for tuning in see you next week